Good morning, church. My name is David Graycheck. I'm the pastor of the church. Uh, I probably know you, but I can't see you. So I figured it might be easier just to let you know that I'll be the one that is sharing God's word with you today. Um, those of you at home, I'm so delighted you can be with us. Um, be looking for information on our website uh, that is coming out more and more about the classes that we have and the times and fellowship that we have during the week. Uh, Monday mornings at 10 o'clock, we gather, we drink coffee together, we laugh at each other, but we also go on a little mental vacation together. Um, I'm sorry that you weren't able to be with us um, this past Wednesday or this past uh, Monday when uh, Wendy shared with us her trip, um, but we'll make sure that, that we ask her to share another because her, her kayaking and her canoe trips are wonderful. We do that on Monday mornings at 10, Tuesdays at 3 o'clock. Um, we have a time just of tea. It's tea time, right? And so we just have a time to share, to gather, to, to prepare, to pray together, to laugh at each other, and just to kind of talk about stuff. Uh, I, I'm, I look forward to it. It's, it's a wonderful time together. And then Wednesday evenings at 6 o'clock, we have dinner and devotion. And so I sent out a, a, a recipe that we tried last week, uh, and it worked out really well. I'll send another one today. Uh, that we'll have on Wednesday. We'll get together and just share God's word a little bit, share, share a meal as we would love to be able to do in person, but, but we'll do so with what we have available to us today. And so we'll, we'll do that as much as we can. On the screen before and after the service, you will see some items that we need for the blessing bags. Um, I almost wanted to put in there a canoe or a blow-up raft or, or whatever. Good grief, the rain, enough is enough, right? Um, but, but if you would be thinking about those things as you're doing your grocery shopping, anytime we get the opportunities to pick up something and love others to love Christ, we, we will do so in our blessing bags. And so we'll do so as often as we possibly can. With that, let's all stand and in one voice sing, may Christ be praised. Let's sing together. Amen, and please be seated. The first scripture reading today will be Joel chapter 2, 27. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and there is none else, and my people shall never again be put to shame. Words of the Lord. For us today, 
I would ask that you consider those that are afflicted by this awful virus. We've got our president that is in the hospital, and I'm actually, my heart is warm to see people that don't agree with them praying for him and, 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 and wanting the best for him. And I, I think that's a beautiful thing. I think that's when our country comes together. So there are others that we can think of that, that may be ill, that may be not feeling well. Um, and we wish this on nobody. We certainly, we don't want any of that. But there are also great joys uh, that we have. And so with that, um, at the end of the service, my number will be on the screen. I want you to have my cell phone so that you can text me um, some of your concerns. If you have something, I can be praying for you. I'll be on Facebook. I'll be posting that also. Just how, how can I pray for you? I've prayed for us by name during the week, but I also want to be sure that we keep in mind the exact things that we need to be praying for. So please, send me a text, send me an email, whatever it may be, call me. Um, I, I want to be sure that we lift up those in need in, in our prayers. So with that, let me, let me pray for us. Loving God, we come before you today as humbled, knowing that you alone are God. We are grateful that you are in our midst, that you love us right where we are. Lord, there are those that are stricken with this illness. We ask for you to strengthen them, bring them back in our midst. Even if we don't know them, Lord, we want no one to suffer from just such a tragedy. But Lord, there are so many joys. Spending time with a granddaughter. Spending time coming up with other grandchildren, just the joys of our eye. If anyone asks, have you ever seen the face of God, we can say yes. But Lord, we do ask that you unite our country in the coming month as we elect our leaders to lead us. We ask that you go first. You go before us. You hold us together. And help us to understand that you have laid out a path and we follow. We thank you that you loved us first. We thank that you love us in our coming days. But Lord, we are grateful that you are with us here and now. Help us to come together. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The uh, second scripture reading today is from Philippians chapter 1, verses 19 through 26. For I know that through our, your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet, which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your, progress, for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. This is the word of the Lord.
Let's pray together. Loving God, we ask that you open our eyes and open our ears that we might clearly see and clearly hear what you would have us learn from your text. Lord, more than anything we can think of, open our eyes. Open our hearts and make yourself a home. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As I sat thinking about today's text, I sat thinking about a story. It's a story that that a friend of mine told to a a number of us when he was a, a pastor early on in his ministry. He really wanted to memorize scripture so that I'm looking at my pastor friend, so so that he could, when the time came, he would know what would come up in his heart, and he would know how to answer it. He he just knew that, okay, if I just memorize this, I will know that this is what I'll think of when that bad time comes, and I'll know how to handle myself. He was doing it for himself. There was one time he, he told a story that he brought this gentleman's, or I shouldn't say gentleman, this guy's wife to Christ. And I hesitate to use the word gentleman because this guy was in prison at the time that, and he deserved to be there, at the time that, that uh, he brought his wife to Christ. This guy was there for second degree murder, stabbing a man to death. The husband found out about this and was so upset with this pastor, his name was Erwin. He threatened his life when he would be released. Erwin says he gets a note that the day finally came where the man was released from prison and he was summoned to meet the guy at his house. Again, something they don't train you for in seminary. He could easily have avoided the confrontation, refused to go, but he didn't. Driving over to this convicted killer's house who was upset with him, he was overwrought with fear and he's digging in his heart. Lord, share with me a verse. Speak to me. Speak to me, God. Don't let me step into this thing alone. He prayed that God would give him a word to ensure his safety, ensure that he wasn't walking into this mess all by himself. And then a verse that he had never memorized came crashing into his head. To live is Christ, to die is gain. Not the answer he was looking for. Not the verse he wanted at that moment. He could think of a bunch of others. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. That wasn't the one. To live is Christ. To die is gain. We were talking earlier about the scripture read this morning. And it's a little complicated to to figure out. Which is why um, I paid so much money to go to school. I guess. But this isn't the thought that Erwin had when he was going to see this guy. So he goes to see the guy and he meets with him alone. He entered the house and he saw a big blade sitting on the dining room table when he had walked in. Erwin tells the story that the first thing out of his mouth was that blade is going to send you to hell. The guy was astonished, couldn't believe he said it. Erwin couldn't believe he said it. But the truth is that it was that action that was keeping him from a loving relationship with Christ. They went on to have a nice conversation. I think once his pulse slowed a little bit. But the ex-con said, look, I want you to understand why I appreciate you, Pastor. Pastor. It says, you and I are cut from the same cloth. And he was, the pastor was curious where this was going now. And he said, we're both radical. I'm radical for doing whatever in the world I want, but you're radical for God. You're radical for doing the right thing in the right moment. And you needed to come and see me today, and I thoroughly appreciate that. See, I heard this story when I was with a group of other guys, and we were learning what it's like to be sold out for God. 
What it's like to say, my life, the way I am living, is not worth anything. It is for Christ that I am born. Right? To live is Christ, to die is gain, is something that can stir within us to say, hey, to live for David doesn't get me very far. But to live for Christ, well, I am fulfilling something that was written for me a long time ago. Paul here in Philippians, tells us that we have a choice as to how we live our lives. There are some that will suggest to us that we don't have a choice. You just take what comes. And that's a little, I mean, it's, a, it's sad when I hear that. Paul is writing this letter from an awful place. We've talked about it. It's a jail cell about the size of the piano, maybe a little taller, about probably the, as tall as the lamp because he wasn't a tall fellow. Yet he's writing with all of this joy how he sold out for the one who made him, the one that put him on this earth. He sold out for what he is to do. The trauma he was experiencing held nothing compared to who it was that he served. So as we look at this text, for me to live, to die is gain, is clearly the text that I pull from this first. He must have spent a great deal of time thinking about this. Because what are you going to do when you're all by yourself in a place that clearly you don't want to be? You're going to question a lot of things. You're going to question a lot of decisions. You're going to question a lot of awful places that maybe you could have been. How did I get here? What am I doing here? All throughout Paul's writings, he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. All throughout his writings, you'll find him writing along, doing his thing. Not that he was left-handed, but I guess that helps me think myself. And you'll find him, he breaks out in doxology. Doxology is praise God from whom all, right? Praise God. God is amazing. God is just incredible. Praise God. It's almost like he looks at his life. And he sees that God has brought him from where he is, and it just causes him to praise God. It's in a way what he's doing for us here in Philippians. For me to live is Christ. My life means nothing apart from Christ. To die is gain. It doesn't mean for him to go into the ground is gain. It means for him to die to himself. To die to his ways, to die to what he needs, to die to his thoughts, to die like the Cubs did Friday. All right, a couple of you sense my pain. Paul goes on in his letter to explain how he understands his choice and his purposes. He goes on to explain, this is how I've come to realize that I'm about Christ, I'm not about Paul. He says in verse 22, if I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. That means what I do means something. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. I'm taking that as temptation. The flesh. The flesh wants me to do something. Maybe God wants me to do something else. He goes on, my desire is to depart and be with Christ. Get rid of the the, the concern, the fight that is going on within me. What David does is so important. David needs to really realize that step into Christ and forget the battle. Forget the battle of trying to be something you're not. He says, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Paul is suggesting, I need to be in this flesh. I need to be Paul. Because God put me here in a place to share with you. I need to be David. That's me, in case we haven't met. I need to be who I am in this moment because God has asked me to speak this word because somebody that hears it, whether they're at home or whether they're here with us today, needs to understand that there is a plan that is played out within the works that we do. God has in store for each and every one of us a plan that he laid out for us. I, 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 we've talked over the last couple months that not one of us would have planned to be where we are in this doggone pandemic. But somehow, 
Maybe it's a way that God has said, be still and know that I am God. And I'll tack on to the end of that. And you're not. Be still and recognize that there is something that's laid out for us that we are supposed to be doing. Paul is saying that to live in the flesh that is set out before him does him no value. But he's been put in that place to maybe be of value to another. So he's going to live hard. Even if it's in a hard spot. Sharing the gospel. Advancing the gospel. This is the fruit that Paul recognizes comes from living his life. Jesus said in John 15, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. Paul is recognizing that this is what's going on within him. Paul is recognizing that as I do what I am called to do, the joy that builds within me is, is just amazing. And it bears fruit. Paul is reading what Jesus had said. To be a disciple is to advance the gospel, which is how we bear fruit. We could go on and talk about the fruit of the Spirit. We'll do that another day. But I want us to recognize that we're left with a choice. It's a choice. You can accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And you can also live the rest of your life not doing a ding-dong thing. You can. I think I know folks that strive to do that. I think we all do. But Jesus said, I have come to give you life and to give it abundantly. How in the world could we recognize the joys in God's life if we don't recognize that by bearing fruit, that's what brings the most amazing joy we can experience? And that means I'm not going to sit on my backside and do nothing after I've accepted Jesus as Lord. I'm going to say, how can I be a part of what you're doing? How can I be a part? The proof is in the choice that we have in Scripture. You don't have to be a Christian. It's a choice. You don't have to live an abundant life once you accept Christ. It's a choice. You don't have to sit on your sofa and wish that we weren't in a pandemic. That's a choice too. You can live and say, all right, what can I be doing? What is God doing within me? Where do I see God in the midst of this? And how can I spread that kind of joy to another? That's through a phone call, through a letter. I love handwritten notes. I don't always love to send them because you can't read what I write. But it's a choice as to how we live the abundant life today. So I want to talk about a couple of examples about how people lived their life for Christ. And I don't need to go outside of Scripture. Let's talk about the examples inside of Scripture where people realize that this is an ongoing theme. It's not a one-time thing that Paul has stepped upon. All throughout Scripture in Joshua 24, 15, choose this day whether the gods of your fathers who served beyond the regions of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land that you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will choose the Lord. The same thing's going on for Joshua as it was for Paul. He knew he was God's chosen. He knew he was to lead the people into the promised land because Moses wasn't. Choose this day who you're going to serve is what he's saying. Because yes, you can be a part of God's plan, but you don't have to choose to do his work. Living right in a wrong living world is a decision. If I had left paper in the back of the pews and pencils, I would ask you to write that one down. Living right in a wrong living world is a decision. It's a choice. Life comes down to one of two choices. You're either going to serve the Lord or you're going to serve the world. You're going to be in the world 
or of the world. That's a choice. Joshua saw life as black and white and told his people his family was going to live right in a wrong world. That's a choice. How about Daniel? Let's take Daniel as a, as a fiery declaration. Daniel 3, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. He will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set before us. They were given a choice. Worship the gods before you or be tossed into the furnace. And he said, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. And you see these guys walking through the fires, not, or the furnace, not on fire. They were serving their God. How are you going to live right in a wrong living world? You've got to have a no matter what kind of spirit. No matter what. Maybe that's a bracelet we, we need to produce. No matter what happens to me, I'm not giving up on God. No matter what, I am not serving this world. No matter what, even if good things go, if things go good for me, even if everything is fine, even if everything goes, doesn't go, everything goes well, came set. No matter what, I will not serve another other than my living God. No matter what, God is God and I am not. Elijah felt that way. In 1 Kings 19, Elijah said, I am the only one left serving you. Verse 18, God declares, Elijah, there are 7,000 others that feel the same way you do. Elijah learned that not everyone was doing it. Not everyone was living for the devil, though. How about Peter? A proclamation in John 6. After this, many of his disciples turned his back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You mean, God, Jesus, I have a choice? Well, really, what is the choice? Where should we go? It didn't make sense to him because he had already given his life. Freedom seems better than slavery. Peter said there is nowhere to go but the Lord. And I use the word slavery only because that's how someone feels that they are, have given themselves over to whatever the Lord says. It's a situation of a suitor and ambassador. I'll explain that another day. How about the last chapter in Revelation? Revelation 22. The Spirit... And the bride say, come. Anyone who adds to these things, the plagues will be added to them. Anyone who takes away from the words of this prophecy, their names will be taken out of the book of life and out of the holy city. He testifies these things. Surely, surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. The final way to live in a wrong living world is to read the end of the book, the last chapter. I admit I do that often with the books that I read. I'm reading a James Patterson. I want to know where it's going to go. I'm reading a Tom Clancy. Nobody knows where it's going in the middle of the book. You almost have to read a few chapters ahead just to get an idea where you're headed, right? The final way to live, this is saying, is that Jesus wins. Evil loses. You want to make a choice? Rarely will we choose the losing team, right? Unless you're a Cubs fan. Those that live right will end up right. When you read the end of the book and, and realize Jesus wins. We don't know how the end will happen. We never know how to live our lives the right way unless... We lean into an authority that knows more than we do. I've shared before that I shared with my kids on the day of 9-11. They were younger then, 
so they listened to their dad? They were watching airplanes fly into the buildings one after another, and they just couldn't figure out, I mean, seeing it over and over again, and, and, and they couldn't process it. They really couldn't figure out what it was all about. They saw people leaping to their death because it seemed a better alternative as to what they were dealing with with the firing inferno. But I shared with them that day the only thing I could think of, things I think about in my head when I tried to memorize Scripture, which I'm not good at. But I realized that we can't choose how we live. We can't choose how we die or when we die. But we have every ability to choose how we live. We have no ability to know how we die and when we die. That's God's knowledge, not ours. It may be awful. It may not. But we have every ability to choose how we live in the meantime. For me and my house, we will choose the Lord. And as Paul is saying, to live as Christ, to die as gain, I will live my life serving the one who created me, who knew me before I knew myself in the mother's womb. As a church, we have that same choice, guys. We could go along and we could go through all the motions and we could do exactly what we do on a regular basis, and that's okay. Or we can choose this, choose, this is going to be tough. We're going to choose to live for Christ. We're going to choose to step into the gap when that homeless person needs a break. I can tell you that as of this last Monday, your session decided to serve the community. With this pandemic, there have been a few families that, families now, that are staying in shelters and they can only do so for 90 days. Few of them are, for lack of a better term, being kicked out because the time's up. We are going to serve as a place, as we have already talked about with Family Promise, where we are going to make some of our rooms available to these families until they can get back on their feet. We're going to love others to love Jesus Christ. That's a choice that your leaders made. And my friends, I hope we do it on a regular basis. Choose to stand in the gap. Because one day, and I pray it never happens, you will appreciate when someone stands in the gap for you. But it isn't why we make the decision. We make the decision because someone stood in the gap for you and I a long time ago and decided for you to have this right relationship with God, you're going to come before me. And it's, it's what we celebrate in this simple meal. We celebrate the Lord's death until he comes again because he died for you and for me. This isn't any kind of a Presbyterian table. It's a table for Christ, for those who believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord. That's a big choice. It's an important choice. And I pray we all make that choice. Chris, do we have the creed? Okay. With that, let me, let me pray for us. Loving God, I pray over these simple elements, these simple elements of bread and of juice or wine. Lord, we pray that you help us to understand that you become the body and blood as we take it within ourselves, even if it's a thought, even if it's an idea, we still use that concept as a choice. Become part of us with this meal as we become brothers and sisters with our friends around the world. Loving God, we pray all of this in the same way that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. In the power of the glory of Amen. I 
love to hear you pray, church. My friends, on the night in which our Lord was betrayed, he took a simple loaf of bread and he gave thanks. He prayed over it. And he said, take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup and he said, this is the cup of the new salvation sealed in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you celebrate the Lord's death until he comes again. My friends, the body and blood of Christ for the people of Christ. In your cup, your cup has two layers to it. Two layers to the lid. And with my feeble hands, it's not easy for me. So I looked at my friend Jack, or he was Richard. I can't, uh, there it is. I guess I can. I'm handicapped. My thumbs don't work. You can pull the top layer off. My friends, the body of Christ for you. And then the last layer, that's why I usually don't wear white on Communion Sunday. The blood of Christ spilled for you. Did everyone have a cup who would like to receive Communion this morning? All right, let's pray together. Loving God, we thank you so much for the idea of such a simple meal. That in loving you, Lord, and you loving us, there is nothing simple about it. Lord, become part of us. Dwell within us. Guide us, encourage us to stand in the gap, to love others, to love you. It's in your precious son's name we pray, Lord. Amen. With that, I believe if you're ready, let's go ahead. And would you please rise and join me in the singing of our closing song. Let's sing together.
demands my soul, my life, my all, all that I am. What God asks me to do demands everything from me. I love that. Sometimes I don't want to do that. But that's why I'm not God, and he is. My friends, we have uh, just, this is the final week to get your portraits done. If I have not taken your portrait yet, they've turned out incredibly well. Um, and they will be produced in the coming weeks. So please, if you have not contacted me about your portrait, we're getting it done this week. It is the final week. On the way out, you will see a basket. If you could drop your tithes and offerings in there, that would be greatly appreciated. Or if you have some spare change, there's also another basket in the back where we can drop uh, that off in the back. John, I can't see you very well. The cups that you have, there's a little trash can you can bring with you and drop off. That would be very, very helpful as well. Um, so we're trying to figure this thing out, guys. We're trying to, to do our best to love others, and I think it's working out okay. So my friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the light of the Lord's countenance shine upon your face and give you peace. Go now in the name of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. The ushers will escort you out. Yes, John. Yeah, if you wait for the ushers to dismiss you, that would be really helpful. Go in peace.